Yo, Mickey's working again. Mane? Yeah. Yo, Mickey's he's, working again. Where? He's working at a restaurant. He's busing and uh, doing prep cooking. Oh, how does he like that? He does yeah. not like it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was going to offer him work, like 20 bucks an hour in construction. I don't know if he'd be up for that stuff. Right now, he's mixing batter in big trash cans. So I think he would love. <laughs> oh, yeah? Okay. Construction work. <laughs> All right, so we are you we're, we're live uh, on Facebook now, so I think we were ready to to begin. I uh, wanted to welcome everybody um, to this uh, discussion today, this platica on brown identity. It's been nine months since we did the, the first one, um, which we, we got a lot of good feedback on. We had about fourteen thousand people that that reached, so um, so I think. People are definitely interested. Uh, what we're going to do today is uh, we're going to, uh, because this is a topic that so many people, I think, are, um, you know, are, are always are always um, thinking through. Um, but we're gonna we're gonna do this kind of more panel webinar discussion where it's going to be primarily the three of us talking, um, and Flasotiani is going to do the intros uh, of each of us. Um, and so if people definitely, if you have questions, please put it in the chat, we'll try to get to it. And we'll also, you know, you can always reach us for any follow-up questions and thoughts, but we have about an hour and a half today to, um, to explore. We invite you also to look at the, the first one we did back in September. It's on our uh, rasapsychology.org page. It's always there. It's also on the Facebook page and it's on YouTube as well. Um, I think it's just called panel discussion on brown identity, you know, just very, very straightforward. Yeah, we um, do have it on brown continent. Uh, yeah, I think um, Issa set it up so that it should be transmitting on that page right now. Okay. Great. Okay. Excellent. So, um, so I think those are just some of the things we just wanted to, to just kind of um, to say before we got started. Um, Lasotiani is going to be our, our moderator and panelist also. So um, so hand it over to her. Okay, um, First, I want to begin as we always begin in a good way, right? Um, with permission and greeting the guardians of the sacred land that we are currently on here in Albuquerque. Um, the Pueblos, um, Fort Sil Apache, Hikaria Apache Nation, Mescalero Apache, and Navajo Nation. Um, so Taso Kamati, Ometeo. And um, now I would like to introduce the panelists. So Alejandro Martinez, uh, also known as Kiawi, um, is originally from El Paso, Texas, now living in Austin, Texas. He's Native American from uh, Cahuiltecan people of the South Texas border and Anahuaca from one of the various Mesoamerican nations of Central Mexico. <clears throat> and if you'll notice already, we had, last time we had talked about um, names that we choose for ourselves and, and the way we identify. So they're in a good way. Um, like he said before in the last Latica, uh, he already introduced what land he's from and, and what people he's from right there in five seconds, right? <clears throat> he's a teacher and project coordinator at Academia Cuautli a school for bilingual children that reconnects them with their roots and various aspects of their cultures. He's also involved in the area's ceremonial community. Uh, Alejandro is part of a large group of Native Americans from Mexico and Canada, helping to reconnect our Southern relatives with their ancestral identity on social media and through public speaking and teaching events. Um, uh, Kiawid, is that associated specifically with Brown Continent? That work uh, that you're doing, or is it a, a different group? Uh, with the identity reclamation. Well, yeah, yes. Yeah, uh, yes. Uh, through uh, Brown Continent and also uh, other pages like uh, Identify Native. Uh, okay. On the 2020 census, which now we're gonna we have to, we we gotta update it to the 2030 census. So. Okay. That increase Thank the you. numbers. <laughs> yeah. So um, Dr. Manuel Samaripa is the, another panelist. He's a director and co-founder of the Institute for 
Chicano Chicano Chicanx Psychology based in Austin, Texas, where he conducts community workshop pláticas, as well as professional development training for educators and mental health professionals on issues related with uh, Chicano wellness, cultural identity, mental health from a Chicano Chicano Chicanx framework, Manuel's publications and presentations in psychology and education focus on Chicana, Chicana, Chicanx well being, racial responsiveness, cultural revitalization, social justice, and leadership. <clears throat> Myself, um, I am a longtime mommy activist and community organizer uh, working towards social justice within the, again, Latinx. We're using that term we, we discussed last time that while we're providing services and doing work, we use the terms that are that people can connect with um, as we work to shift um, understanding and broaden and deepen understanding of our identity. <clears throat> so I will use the Latinx community for now. <laughs> um, I'm a daughter of a long ago 1930 Sananto Chicano father and a mother from South Texas Vaquero family. Of course, my ancestors go way far back, right? Deep into Mexico and South Texas. Uh, I'm a mommy to three children and currently co-founder and presenter with the Community-Based Institute of Chicano Chicano Chicanx Psychology. Um, I worked for the Collective Latina Mommy for more than 15 years and a past council member for uh, Alma de Mujer and a uh, founding member of Nuestro Grupo, which founded where Kiawit is a program coordinator, Academia Cuautli. Um, my native home is Calpuli Teocali Teoyolo. Uh, and the preservation of culture and community is a driving force in my life. Um, so we can just stay there. I'm, I'm a danzante de la luna and a danzante with danza mexica Xochipilli. Um, so all the work that I do, um, community work is medicine toward the liberation, the healing and the flourishing of my children and our people. So that is us. And um, so we're gonna go ahead and begin. Uh, first off, you know, this, this is a um, very emotional topic. Um, so just be aware of yourself, what you're going through as you're decolonizing or as you're reconnecting. Um, sometimes we get angry, right? When we address our identity, we may even feel like um, we're doing something wrong by, by claiming and, and uh, standing strong for uh, who we are and reclaiming our identity in, in good ways. So, so just be aware of that and work with yourself as, if you have any emotional things that are big or heavy for you. So our history is a complex, multi, multifaceted history. Um, and we as a people have tremendous strengths uh, in our ancestry, tremendous medicine. We have tremendous ways, knowledge, uh, wisdom, abilities, and we have a colonized history of rape and torture our sacred items and our cultural treasures burned, separated from our cultural lineage, um, our racial lineage, invisible arbitrary lines drawn uh, called borders on our native land and told that we don't belong here and that we're a drain on the economy and that we're criminals. <clears throat> so it seems invisible that our people are still picking up, picking the food that comes to our tables um, in fire conditions, COVID conditions, poverty, without any healthcare resources. Uh, people feel like it's justified that our sisters, brothers, relatives, families are ripped apart, raped, tortured with complex trauma to the children and the families that cannot heal within the next several generations. Um, and people actually blame the parents for bringing the kids over, right? When they were trying to escape terrible living situations and trying to survive. So um, this is why, one of the reasons why it's important to understand who we are and our identity. Um, language is important and it's important what we call ourselves. Uh, it matters what we think, what we say, what actions we take. We're gonna take some time here to unpack and look a little deeper into what we call ourselves and what it means. And you know, some elders have said, ah, oh, they're tired of this conversation. We've been having it for a hundred of hundreds of years, trying to organize, come together, gain social justice, gain power. But it's important to keep at it and um, and to see what we can come to. So we are going to begin right off with the first question. Let's see. So we'll start uh, with Kiawit. Very simply, first question. 
Um, we talked a little bit about why it's important, but why would you say it's important to have these discussions about our identities, what we call ourselves, uh, our labels? Um, yeah. I think the, the, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, well, one of the main reasons is to uh, recuperate as a people who we are, uh, because there's millions of us, especially uh, Spanish speaking Native Americans who don't know who they are, many of them also here in the United States, who uh, are misidentifying themselves with many uh, colonial misnomers, as we call it, you know, when we when we call ourselves Mexican Americans, um, we're given credence to the existence of nationality. And we have to remember nationalities come from being a citizen of any given country. And we have to remember that this is all about remembering, okay? Remembering, remembering who you are. Uh, nationalities go back to countries and countries. We have to remember that countries were created by Europeans the very different Europeans from different European territories who came here and fought one another over our continent. And they had to, uh, you know, stake their claim. So they had to create these bo the apartheid borders that separated us. So with the creation of borders of the countries, we have the borders that separated us. And now we're misidentifying ourselves with these nationalities, whether we were born in Canada, a lot of natives up there are calling themselves Canadians. Here, a lot of us are calling our, uh, we're calling ourselves U.S. citizens, Americans, Mexican Americans, and Mexico people are calling themselves Mexicans. Many Native Americans in South America are calling themselves Bolivia, Bolivians, Argentinos, Chileans, Colombianos, Brazilians, you know, all up and down the entire continent. So, I mean, the important part about identity is to remember who we are so that we're not lost. In other words, why are we gonna lose ourselves into a system that we do not belong to? And in the first place, we have to identify the fact that it never wanted us and it has always used us and still uses us to, to, to stay alive, it feeds off of us. You know, so, you know, if we don't know who we are, we're just gonna allow ourselves to be uh, subject to abuse and manipulation because once we identify ourselves according to our race as Native Americans, then that sets a process in motion where uh, we begin to put the pieces together within. And, uh, you know, because you, you start saying, well, I'm Native American, that means I'm from here. Then you realize that white people are Europeans that crossed the ocean and invaded, they're not from here. And then you begin to tell yourself, well, wait a minute, that means I'm on my continent. This is my homeland. How come I'm homeless on my homeland? Where, how come I don't have any land? Who are my people? Where are they from? You know, when we, when we start to remember that, and also as human beings, we, we want that sense of belonging to something, our community, a family, and the family belonging to a larger community where we had our, our civilization and our communities based on that. And that's, that's, and that's all over the world, wanting to belong, being part of a community, you know? So rather than being, you know, walking through darkness, you know, we just, we just, we're looking for, a lot of us are looking for that connection. And it's more so now than before we notice. I mean, you, every, a lot of us, sorry about that. A lot of us are, uh, took a little fall there. <laughs> um, a lot of us are beginning to remember. And if we see on social media, identity is a really huge topic. It's a very heated debate where we're fighting one another over it because a lot of us don't wanna believe and we wanna deny what happened that began 500 years ago with the invasion and what it took to get us to the position where we're at, where we don't know who we are, we're landless, we're at a loss, you know, we, we don't have access to our own resources. You know, and we're the subject of genocide, I mean, ongoing genocide, and it hasn't stopped. You know, so when we begin to put the pieces together, you know, we're going to eventually come around just saying, well, you know what, we want our land back. You know, we don't want to live like this anymore because we used to think that it was, that's just the way life is and that it's normal. But it's because we've been raised and bred in a, in a situation that where we're conditioned 
and manipulated. So think of yourself being raised in an enclosed box, disconnected from your ancestral roots. And there's people on the outside of the box turning dials and pushing buttons, you know, to either make it a little bit hotter, a little bit colder, apply some pressure from this angle, uh, a visual assault, manipulation from this angle, uh, propaganda coming from here just to keep you in line to make you think that you're somebody who you're not, you know, to, to be a part of the new civilization that came from across the ocean. To, to get you to keep you at a point where you'll never question any of it and you'll never ask who you are but we have to see the invasion as being knocked out unconscious it was a blow to the head you fell down you were knocked out eventually you're going to regain consciousness and your memory starts to come back just like in a fight or a car accident you're like whoa Anybody get the license number? <laughs> it's like, anybody get the plate numbers on that? I just, I barely remember being hit by a car. Same thing with the invasion. Millions of people are beginning to wake up. They're beginning to remember. They're coming out of, uh, you know, they're regaining consciousness and they're starting to ask questions. So that's why identity is a big topic. And it's a topic for a lot of debate because, you know, uh, they've got us in a position where we're in denial of who we are. So we, we're, we're our own worst enemies. We fight one another when it comes to wanting to say who we are, you know, and, and you know, should you have the right to claim that? But uh, we need to have these discussions. It's healing. It's healing. It is healing. Thank you for that. And you brought up so many things that I, I'm thinking from the lens of people who may be new to this conversation, like if you don't unpack it, it sounds like you're saying, you know, anti-American things like, why you don't want me to say I'm American? You know, we're so many steps away from understanding what that means and that it means that we're here to stay and that we're not illegal and that people in cages and detention centers, you know, then that blows that away. You also brought up um, talking about how we don't want to see what happened, that invasion in the 1500s, so terrible. And we are so very much feeling still and, and, and trapped a lot of the time in those, the, the ramifications of that, that we don't want to see. And I want to come back to those things. Um, also, recently, the Institute for Chican, Chican, Chicana, Chicana Psychology had a, a platica workshop really with a, one of the psychologists where, where um, she had us actually listen to 30 seconds of kids being separated from their parents and talk about wanting to turn away. A lot of us had to turn away, had to do work to feel better, to, to deal with ourselves. Um, I can see why we don't want to face, you know, see who we are so that we can find a way to stop these things. It's difficult. Um, Dr. Samaripa, uh, Manuel, I'm going to call you Manuel. Uh, what why is it important to you uh, in the work that you do and uh, personally that why we have do this work, why we talk about labels and, and identity and what we call ourselves? Yeah, no, I think, um, you know, of course, everything that uh, the Gyawi, you know, talked about uh, or things that we're facing daily. Um, and, and just, you know, and from the, uh, just from another um, side of it is just the very basic idea that we all know um, that getting a sense of who we are is fundamental to, to every single person, knowing who we are. Um, that's why in the field, you know, this whole idea of uh, identity, development, and all that, you know, is so crucial because if, if you don't have a solid foundation, if you don't have the roots um, that we all come with, those roots, then then you are, you can, you can be lost. You know, we know that um, it, it can be un, uh, just unhealthy. You see plenty of adults, you know, still wandering, not really knowing who they are, what their purpose is. So even more so for us that come with this history of, um, of exclusion, of uh, colonization, that um, where, where there, is no, there are no easy paths to, to reconnect to remember, 
to find out about who we are, you have to go searching for this. You know, we have to do it on our own. We have to make those paths. And, and that is um, one of the things that I think, uh, like Yahweh yeah, was saying, where you look up and you realize things. That's one of the things that I always tell people is, is uh, look up and, and if you wanted to find out about who you were, um, why, why haven't you done that now? It's because those resources aren't readily available. That doesn't happen in our mainstream educational uh, it doesn't happen in, in the media that we get streaming into us. Uh, you, we have to look for it. And that's, you know, not a, a, an accident. And without those pathways, without these discussions, without us making those paths to, to reconnect to who we are, to have a, a, a healthier sense of who we are, because everywhere you look, it's easy. You know, when you do find things about who we are, you know, it's always negative. That's easy to find, you know, or it's misconstrued at, at best. Um, but to, to find information about who we are in a healthy way, you, you have to you have to make that path. You, we have to make these connections with each other. And without a sense of who you are, you're always going to be searching. You're always going to be you're lost. There's always going to be a piece uh, of you. That's just on an individual level. Now. Imagine, which is true, that you as that individual are connected to a community of millions all together wandering. And if millions all together remembered uh, and reconnected, then not only do we get a sense of our, our identities as individuals, we start to regain a sense of our identities as a community, as a people. Um, and that I think is, is an important thing to always, I think, keep in mind. Uh, that's what we're always moving toward in, in anything that we do. So, you know, from a, you know, from, from a psychology perspective, that's a whole other issue about the way I think about psychology compared to the way it's usually out there is, um, is um, from that little piece, one thing that remains true is that, um, it, is that identity is our foundation. You know, identity is the foundation of everything. So we need to have a strong, healthy sense of who we are. And when we do, um, you know, for what it's worth, you know, it depends on who does what, but you know, there, there's plenty of, of studies and research out there that say like, when you know who you are, especially culturally, then, um, you know, you are quote unquote successful and however you wanna do that in the things that you move toward because you, you're more rooted, right? Um, and, and I say that because kind of the main narrative is the more we get closer to who we are, the more we have pride in who we are, the more divisive it is, right? The more we're anti this and anti that. And the more, yeah. it, the opposite is true. You know, the more we know who we are, the more that we can more authentically connect with other groups and other people, because we know who we are, we can't be swayed, right? And, and when you come from that position, then we can move through the world, because we're always going to share this planet, right? But, but we are not sharing the planet in, in our own, you know, authentic sense of self, you know, that's been taken from us. And so I think um, those are some of the things that, that I was thinking about right now. Yeah. Um, yes, yeah. You know, yes, yeah, so what, what, uh, what both of you said, you know, and what hit me to answer your question, just one sentence or one word is that, uh, it's important to have these discussions because our survival depends on it, you know, to wrap, you know, to put everything that we put together. And uh, Manuel pointed out something really, really interesting about being accused of being divisive because that's happened to a lot of us. That's a Why are you being divisive? Thing. Why are you, you, you want to call yourself Native American? That's divisive. You're going, you know, in other words, you're going against their, their colonized minds. And no, we're Latinos, we're all human beings, we're Hispanic, we're uh, Chicanos, we're Mexican-American, we're this, we're that. But once you say you're Native American, you're race, you're divisive. So that, that on the psychological level, that talks about how we've been rewired backwards to work against one another. But yes, uh, all this, this, these discussions are important because our, our survival depends on this, on our identity. And I, I would like to add to that, um, that even just the, the, the less, I don't want to use the word divisive, what is it? The lesser um, inflammatory label of even Chicano, a lot of people are like, oh no, I don't want to use that term, or raza. I mean, it's so many layers to 
to mm -hmm. unpack and to separate out as to what is a strength, you know, what is what is um, a way that it can help us move forward? Yeah, not just survive, but thrive, right? And then answering that question from a mother's perspective, um, just, you know, we're looking at it from a macro lens, right, that affects all of us as a community, but also individually um, and in our families. <clears throat> if we know who we are, we have that strength of who we are. And, and we're, for example, um, fighting with the school system, which I have, I have been raising kids under the age of 13, so over 13 and under 13 consistently for almost 24 years. So I have had a tremendous amount of battles, right, for their wellness, advocating for having, for, for my brown children. And, and if we unify under the identity of who we are, then on the, on the smaller levels, when I'm in a battle like that, I look around and nobody shows up, right? Other moms are like, ugh. She's saying things and let me back away, right? <clears throat> so that's bruising to me as a mother, bruising then to the family, right? And, and then if we want to think on a larger scale, knowing that we're related to everything that is, everything that exists, like these plant and uh, trees, you know, abuelos and brothers and sisters that we've been visiting, the Sierra Mountains that we gave tobacco to, um, that we went up to the top to, and de cantos, and all of these things that we're related to, right? Um, uh, we don't know the power of that, somebody coming to, to our aid in these battles. I'm going back and forth here, but, but also, too, um, when specifically battling for one of my children, you know, in the school system, who was already going down the school to prison pipeline, who was already be sent, being sent to alternate, alternative school, who was labeled as, uh, from first grade, told me that he was, um, what was the word manual they used? Deviant. He was deviant. A first grader, sweet little boy. Anyway, so all the way through, right? Okay, so seventh grade, you know, school to prison pipeline, all that. But what was under that was um, a health issue, right? Lyme's disease that affected the brain, all this stuff. How could I ever get that affected mental health in, in huge ways, right? Still do. How could I have ever have gotten to that information if I agreed with them, if I didn't know who I am, if I didn't know who my people are, if I agreed with what well, we're criminals, well, he's just bad, all of the negative things that are put on, on, on us. If I would have agreed with all of that, I never would have continued the search to find out what's at the root of these um, supposed bad behaviors, right? Which were not even bad is self-medicating and things like that. So, so what is at the root? I couldn't have gotten there if I didn't know my position, where I am, who I am as a mother. So just think about that. In just one small instance, knowing who we are can allow us to move towards and investigate further towards the wellness of ourselves, seven generations back, seven generations forward, our own children. So we're talking in big ways and in little ways in which identity is so important and affects us in, in a multitude of ways. Um, so we're gonna move on. Um, so gosh, we could talk forever even about just why it's important, <laughs> right? In the last one, uh, the last platica, I encourage you all to go back and listen to it. I did last night and it really, we went in depth a lot. It's called Brown Identity Panel Discussion, where we were, where we are now. It's on YouTube, it's on rasapsychology.org. I think it's on the Brown Continent page. Um, but we talked about more deeply the terms Latino, Hispanic, Chicano, Mexican American, Anahuaca. Uh, I don't think we talked about mestizo. We might want to cover that one, but but we went really deep. We talked about Latinidad, right? We talked about white Latinos. We talked about um, if we have the right to even try to reconnect and and uh, and learn more about our identity. We went pretty deep into those things. I think we went over an hour and a half. <clears throat> so I encourage you to go back to that. Uh, Dr. Samaripa just put the link in the chat also. Um, so moving on, okay, moving on. And again, I, I said, let's take care of ourselves if things get heavy, if you need to take, take breaths, go for a walk, have some tea. So we're gonna start already with a, a, a big question. Um, 
I know we we need to talk more about uh, why these things, these discussions are not anti-American. They're not um, they're not uh, trying to be divisive. We talked about that. So starting off with all that that's happening and been happening to our people for the last 550 years, you know, still today with the detention centers, kids separated from their parents. Um, you know, the rape that happens uh, there, the, the girls and the boys molestation, the removing of, of uh, these women's uteruses, right? That was reported in Georgia. And I think it was um, February, September, I think, I'm not sure, but 2020. So just this last year. Um, that, and then things that you don't think are apply, like the 11 year old boy, uh, Cristian Pineda, who who uh, in the power outages this past winter in Texas, he froze um, in his trailer home with it. You know, he was there with his three-year-old brother. I know I'm saying hard things and, and normally we turn away from that stuff uh, because it's hard. Um, but how is that related? Let's think, what does it have to do with our identity or, or um, access, right? Um, and then also Dr. Roberto Sintli Rodriguez has a team um, doing uh, documenting police murders, right, of Raza, which is well into the thousands. Um, just from May to November alone, there were 102 police murders of Latinos, 2,600 police murders um, of us from 24, since just since 2014. And since 2000, um, gosh, I think that number, what was that number manual? I don't know. I, I didn't enter it, but it was, it was thousands and thousands. So and now, including historically taking away not just our land, our sacred items, our connections to who we are, which is why we're having these discussions. Um, why do we not unify about these very real things? Why do we feel like it's divisive to talk about them? Why are you know we not making sure that journalists are covering any of this news? Um, why is it easy to, and seems like our people's struggles are invisible, right? Um, the notion that we're somehow illegal, have no validity on this land, right? Um, that we're criminals, that our lived experiences are invalid. So our suffering and our pain um, doesn't appear to be happening or deserve compassion, resolution, justice. Why is this? I know it's a big question, but what are your thoughts on that? Um, Kiawi, do you want to start? You're on mute, Edmano. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, I hope you didn't say anything earth shattering. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, I was, I was stuttering. It's all right. <laughs> but um, we'll start with uh, why it seems invisible. Uh, our struggle, our survival, um, our voices. Why are we silent? And um, why are we not covered by journalists? Because once, if that gets out in any form, it becomes a topic of major debate and the media is not gonna touch it. Who owns all the media search? But if it gets out there more than the, the topic of stolen land and genocide is gonna have to come out. And the topic of whose land does this really be, you know, who? Who does the land belong to, you know, or who are the original people from here and what happened to them? And the story of invasion is going to have to be touched. So uh, I really feel, I honestly feel that uh, we lost you, Hermano. Okay. Oh, there you are. There you are. Right, sorry. You're back. Connection pause. You know, we're gonna be brushed under the carpet, under the rug, because those are the things that cannot be talked about in mainstream media, you know, for obvious reasons. They're not gonna talk about the millions of Native American lives that have been murdered. They're not gonna talk about ongoing genocide that we're, a lot of our people and us in many ways, silent or, you know, upfront are, are trying to, to uh, you know, to survive from. Um, the things that you mentioned, 
you said with all that's happening and been happening to our people in the last 500 plus years, the detention centers, kids separated from their parents, we, it's very important that we investigate and we do the history to not, and not see these things as isolated events. Because when you hear of children in cages being separated from their families, you hear about the, for instance, uh, on the East Coast, the, that one doctor who was performing uh, hysterectomies on, on Native women that were being held in these detention centers, uh, so-called immigrant or illegal alien women. <clears throat> yeah, we froze uh, a little bit. Not an isolated event. Hmm. Okay. Can you hear me? Did I come up? Yeah, you're back. Okay. Uh, these are not isolated events. We need to go back in time, and it's documented by Bartolomé de las Casas that when Columbus invaded the island, he kidnapped nine-year-old girls, that sounds familiar, separating them from their families and selling them or giving them off to his captains and other soldiers. So these women, these little girls were raped and they were sold off also and traded, you know, as prostitutes, as uh, a sexual commodity. So then we have the beginning of the sex trade in the Western hemisphere. We have that very beginning of children being separated from their families. Boys too were separated from their families and they were, they were enslaved. So we have the beginning of children being separated from their families, more than likely put in cages, tied up, being bound, being sold off, being shipped off. Okay, and then we go to the Indian boarding schools. Here in the United States that were created by uh what's his name uh Pratt Richard Colonel Richard Pratt same thing the children were stolen and kidnapped and taken illegally from their parents they were shipped off deported far away all this is sounding familiar right we're gonna we're gonna draw a pattern here and they were forced to go to these detention centers where they were forced and manipulated and tortured and beat and raped to learn to assimilate to become somebody that they were not so these children were forcefully cut off from their ancestral ties their language their culture now we can go to canada we're across and the 215 children who were found under that that one uh residential school or church that's just a drop in the bucket in canada alone same thing the children were picked up by indian agents or agents of the crown, stolen from their families, caged, locked up, taken in horse carts, uh, even into the 1900s, uh, put on airplanes, deported to another part of their continent, you know, you know, quote unquote, deported, illegally removed, put in the hands of white people who were part of the church, and the Canadian education system into the residential schools where the same thing happened, where they were beat, they were raped, they were tortured, they were killed to force and forced to assimilate to the white European culture, their religion, their language, their customs, their ways. Same thing in Mexico. We can go to Mexico and all of South America with the encomienda system imposed by the Spaniards. Men and women, children were stolen from their families and forced to work on the encomienda systems, which is the, the Hispanic version, Spaniard version of the plantation system. So this is an ongoing thing that began in 1492. This is not an isolated event that we're seeing, you know? And they have to do this to maintain control of the land. That's what it's always been about. Because if they don't, forcefully assimilate, domesticate the original people like they did our ancestors, there's no way they would be able to dominate the entire continent. So that's what this is, uh, that's why this is going on because it hasn't stopped. It's, and they need to do this to take control of the land, keep control of the resources, you know, and misidentify you. That look how important identity is, you know, I mean, we don't even think to draw lines right from the past all the way now we right it feels like a new thing happening 
uh, over the past few years, these detention centers. <clears throat> and the fact that they're even called detention centers. I mean, language matters, right? This is imprisonment. This is, you know, I know I, I know it's triggering that we're saying, you know, rape of these boys and girls. And however, if we don't have these conversations that are hard, if we turn away, you know, who's going to have them, right? They're, they are hard. They are hard. And again, take care of yourself. If you need to step away or have some tea or go for a walk, come back, watch it later. Um, Manuel, what, why, what are your thoughts on all this that, that we're not seeing, you know, these things that are, have been historically happening and are currently happening, um, talking about separating, separating families. And again, very important to talk about the term migrant or immigrant, right? On our own land with these imaginary borders. So why do you think we're not, you know, not just that, why do you think we're not talking about them or we're not unifying around these issues and we're not making sure we get, you know, that it's out in the news for people to hear about why, not just why, but what are your thoughts on this? Um, yeah, really, um, I think there's some things in there that, that I was hearing. Um, from both what you were saying right now, Colasso Tiani and, and, and Hermano Kiawi, um, that came to my mind was our, our community is always under this framework of new and recent. Um, so, you know, when we look at the way that we're, we're framed as immigrant um, or, or migrant really, but you know, the, the, uh, the language is immigrant. It's always, um, you know, recent immigrant, recent immigrant. We, and that always hides, again, the fact that we've been here. Uh, we've been here before the Europeans, even typical contemporary Mexican immigration, if you call, um, has always, you know, has always been occurring. We've been here um, since before the United States had its borders in the Southwest. All of this is a, a, a dominant narrative that one of the reasons why we can kind of be pushed aside is because we're recent, we're new. It's always the, you know, like this is just happening and these incidents of the separation as Kiawi pointed out is not new. Um, we, there have been various ways in which we have always been torn apart, but it's a new thing, right? Um, and, and then we're surprised, you know, uh, you know, um, it looks like we're taking a step backwards. People are saying, oh my God, I can't believe in this day and time that a government approved this detention centers and separations of, of, of families at the border. And it is barbaric and we should be shocked and outraged, but we have to be careful because that narrative always comes out as, oh my God, we're moving backwards. And every time, if you go back and look at, you know, the quotes from newspapers and, and what people were saying, they always say the same thing. Oh my God, we came so far and now we're going back. They said that 50 years ago, they said that 100 years ago when things were happening in that way. They said it 200 years ago when things were, we always see ourselves as progressive and, and we always say, oh my God, I can't believe we're still doing this. Um, so we have to put that in context, I think, because that, that, that root of that history, um, we need to hold on to that and we need for it to be clear. I also um, was thinking when you were saying that as, uh, when, you, when you were talking about um, why, we see, why aren't we talking about it? You know, why aren't we addressing these issues? And again, that goes back to this kind of the way, the way media outlets and information is distributed. Because on the one hand, we've always been talking about it. We've always had platicas like this. There's always been activism in our communities. There's always been people that have pushed. There's always, but, but those voices aren't recognized on a larger level, right? Um, those that's never considered part of mainstream news, mainstream reporting, mainstream education. And so what happens is that our children and children's children and many of us in the community, we get that message reflected. And so then we feel like we are not doing something right because what we're doing is very is always very localized. It's always very within the circles of people who are doing something. Um, and the pathway of bringing it out larger into um, the larger community is never there because the larger community, again, um, you know, there's so much to say, but I'll just leave it with this. You know, one thing is for, for many reasons, the larger white community still really, they don't understand us. They still really don't know who we are. 
because we have not been part of the the narrative narrative of this country's who this country is right and who this country belongs to um they, they really don't they really don't really know who we are still um and and we can't be kind of fooled by um yes we have some representation you know in terms of political representation yes we have some media representation but that always goes back to this notion that that a lot of us have heard and that you know that for me i heard from dr rosales at university of texas in san antonio where um he calls it the illusion of inclusion right it's an illusion of inclusion you have a few of us here a few of us there we have a, a few people and then it, it looks like yes the country is being inclusive uh, of who we are but not really right you know we still we still have you know a past President Trump and, and as, as the main, you know, easy target, right? But you still have people, even to this day, again, again, that idea of shock, talking about, you know, we came, we civilized this land, and we're not going to apologize for civilizing this continent. You know, they, we still have people saying that as of six months ago, um, major political. So people still think in that way, uh, um, as if we, as if the native people here were savages, as if we didn't know how to live in a good way, as if we didn't have advancements in our own way. Just because we didn't want to conquer, did it, does it mean that um, you know? Um, does it mean that we weren't living with each other and with and with the land? Um, so as I'll just stop there. So I had so many different thoughts. Um, you, you said something really important about the illusion of inclusion. And uh, one of the topics that some of us have talked about that we pointed out is that it is an, it is an illusion. And, you know, maybe we could change our perception on that instead of trying to clamor at their doors, banging on their doors, wanting to slap them on the wrist and, oh, please don't say that anymore to us. Please don't treat us like that, begging them for mercy. Because that, that keeps us in the victim, the victim position. And they have us trapped in an illusion, chasing their illusion that one day we might be equal to them, fighting them for equality. And why do we do that? Because we don't know who we are. We're chasing their illusion and they're laughing at us the whole time. Yeah, they're going to budge. They're going to just give them a little bit of recognition to shut them up. Because you, you can, like in a pressure cooker, you need to have that escape valve for the steam to escape or it'll explode. They understand this. They understand that they apply economic pressures, propaganda, and other hardships on people within their, you know, within their little, uh, let's call it a dog pen, all right? A dog kennel. And we have all these pedigree names, okay? Because after 500 years of domestication and assimilation, it's like we have to apply these artificial pressures to keep these uh, different pedigrees in check and not let them realize that their ancestors were wolves, part of the natural surrounding. Okay, so we got to let them think that they're making some headway in their civil rights, in their 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 inclusiveness. We're gonna make them feel like we're include we're including them, you know, and they're gonna budge. But ultimately. I mean, it's all an illusion. As long as they keep us chasing that 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 piece of that carrot in front of us, you know, and like, you know, and we're we're going in the wrong direction, you know. And the narrative that you spoke about, like, why are we not be, why are white people not talking about this? Because it's they don't care about that, you know. Uh, I read a one this one thing that said they don't care about us because they're not about to. Oh yeah, you're right. You know what? Here's the land. Here's the keys to my house. Here's my my fifty thousand acre ranch. You're right. They're not gonna let go of what their ancestors took, and you know, and uh, there's a you know, it's not about convincing them about who we are. It's about us convincing ourselves and one another as to who we are. That's uh, I think that's that should be our main focus, because when that happens then every, it's like, again, it's gonna set things in motion that cannot be reversed because once these millions of people realize that they're Native American, they're gonna start talking, they're gonna start organizing, they're gonna start building communities with one another because that's what we do naturally as people. That's what we have done ancestrally for thousands and thousands of years. 
and they're going to organize. It's like, you know, we're collectively, we're sick of this. We're tired of this. We're tired of being abused. We're tired of being home, you know, homeless on our homeland, you know, and things are going to set, it's going to set in motion. They're going to use the political system too. They're going to use all the tools that they have at hand, you know? And uh, the one last thing I wanted to address really quick with La Soltiani was saying about how we're somehow illegal or we have no validity. Yes, they call us illegal to make us look, make us think that we have no validity. That's another illusion being imposed on us. So if they get away with branding us and we believe it, we're never going to come around to realizing who we really are. And if we don't realize who we are, we're never going to come around to really like fighting for who we are and what you know, what what belongs to us, you know, what was taken from us and reclaiming stolen property, you know, so they got to brand us, they got to keep us in that position of thinking that we're illegal. Thank you. That we're insignificant, that we're a tiny powerless minority. Yeah, Sorry. thank you for that from both of you. And that's bringing up so many things. And I'm thinking about from the lens of somebody who's not used to talking about this, right? And, and I do encourage you to watch the first um, discussion on brown identity because we went through and talked about each <clears throat> each name, you know, Latino, Hispanic, and and so that will be a good foundation because now we're going so much deeper about why um, identity, all these things that they're tied to, right? Who would have thought that identity is tied to distribution of of uh, resources, right, or having land being able to afford land like this whole credit system that doesn't allow people to have land even if you have an income that can afford it and then about controlling the prices of having land and then just ownership on and on and on and on and on right or education or how we think about ourselves i mean who would have made these bridges right if we we're just at the beginning of thinking about this stuff that that naming ourselves, that that having an, a pride, an ethnic pride, uh, uh, knowing who we are racially, that any of that would have to do with so many different facets of our lives, right? So it, it may take you a while to make those bridges, to make those connections, and to notice in yourself if you feel like uh, this conversation is divisive, this conversation is anti-American, you know? Um, really think about how people knowing who they are, knowing um, our history and how, the way it affects us in this contemporary coloniality, talking about colonization as an invasion, you know, not just like, oh, we came and colonized and made everything nice, but, but understanding it as an invasion, all these different things um, how they're not divisive. Why would that not be divisive? Does anybody want to just specifically um, address that? Dr. Samaripa, do you want to address that? Oh, sure. Um, well, I think um, it, it us coming together and having the discussions is what we need to do. We're not we're not always going to have uh, one of the reasons why we're not going to be at the same place at the same time and not always just come together and settle it once and for all is is because of everything we've just been saying you know because we have not been allowed to connect who we are we've been divided by the way the society is set up so um you know the promises like the carrot of, of what we can get if we follow a certain path and, and believe a certain way and assimilate a certain way. So, you know, all of that um, is going to, you know, guarantees that we're at different places, guarantees that, you know, we've had different experiences. Um, so uh, when we when we try to have these discussions within ourselves, um, it may be difficult, um, but it's always, I think, going to be a step in the direction of us coming together because the divisiveness is us not talking about it. The divisiveness is that each of us thinking in our own our own identities that that's the right one or that's the better one, and not working through it together. And and also it is divisive for not for us but for the larger society for the societal structure that is set up um, because um, it it. it um, it's something that that is uh, a conversation that doesn't fit into that structure, right? Because um, 
as, as we've said, you know, that can threaten the power structures that are already in place. Um, and, and so um, I think we do need to kind of think about it in, in a way that coming together is not divisive. The divisiveness is not coming together and staying in our silos. Uh, uh, and, and even, you know, we have to move, we have to move, we have to move step by step. Even if in this generation, with each of our lifetimes, you know, again, uh, the answer isn't settled once and for all, um, we move in this direction, right? We have to continue moving. Uh, and even that idea, you know, we, you know, in, in the workshops and the work that we do uh, with the Institute of Chicano Psychology, one of the things that we're always say is, um, you know, we have to move beyond this like individualistic Western lens of everything in our life. Um, so even that idea that we have to come up with that particular one single answer for us to be unified, that's a Western European individualistic way of thinking about things that need to be resolved or settled. We have always ancestrally known that there are multiple ways to exist, multiple ways to look at things, multiple ways to be. But underlying all of that, you know, our unity was that we were always in it together. We were always trying to do what's best for the larger group, best for the land that we're living in. And so this idea that we always have to come up with the one right, you know, you know, label, the one right, whatever, that may be, you know, a very Western way of doing things. Now, strategically and politically, I think, because again, we can't just pretend we're not in this society. Oh, okay, we're native, let's go back to our ancestral ways. Well, like who's gonna pay the bill for the light and who's gonna, you know I mean? So, right, but, so, but strategically, um, when it comes to trying to um, recognize why we choose certain ways of looking at ourselves, um, then we do have to, we have to, to make those decisions, but we have to know that we're making those decisions because there are some things that are necessary to do to move forward, like um, like identifying native on the census. I mean, you know, that isn't a really that's that's crucial. Um, it's important for the for that to be recognized that um, that if you are from this continent, um, then you are native to this continent. And um, so in that way, there are certain, certain times where we're like, okay, let's strategically choose this. But in the larger sense, we don't always need to have like the one final punto final, that's it, we're done. That's not our goal here, you know, but we need to keep moving forward and, and, and understanding that things happen in their own time. Things happen over generations. like. My brothers and sisters and siblings are suffering right now, so we need to do that now. We need to address that now. But the larger picture of how we heal and come together, we need to recognize that that is, you know, something that we're always moving toward, always moving forward, um, and 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 how we have that as part of of our notions of um, of unity. It's a larger concept. It's not just this Western individualistic concept. So it's about unifying, it's about being well, it's about not just surviving, but thriving, right? For our families, for our people. It's about reconnecting, remembering who we are, are some themes that I'm hearing, and about gaining uh, power, which is why this is such a hot topic, and why through internalized depression, we fight with each other, because we're trying to take power that is perceived to not be ours, you know? Um, from people who do not want to give it in a violent way, right? <clears throat> and but what about the people who are who are watching this that are like, you know what? I work hard. I work hard. I drop off my kids. I keep the house nice. I provide them food. You know, we go to work. You know, at eight, and we come home at six, and we barbecue on Sunday. You know, we go to church. I don't know about all this native stuff. You know, racially, but what about culturally? Like. You know, I just, I'm, I just want to, you know, be Mexican American or, you know, and, and uh, how do I connect to this? 
how would you speak to those people who, you know what, they, they do have ancestral trauma, passed down trauma. They do have, you know, issues that affect their children and, and access to resources, but don't know how to connect to this large conversation. Um, and I'm thinking about unifying. We've talked about how important it is to unify. So how would we, what, what do we have to say to those people, you know, that just logged on and just want to know how to identify or, or, or what, what the best term is to use. I mean, how do you reconcile that for those people watching? Um, Gyawi, do you want to take that one first? Sure. Well, um, it's interesting because I was at the dump the other day and I started having a conversation with one of the, uh, the young men that worked there that received the, the trucks you know, and they tell you where to back up. It was like a lot of construction debris. And uh, we started talking and then, well, this guy didn't know anything about who he was or whatever, but he, he asked me, uh, he's like, uh, I know you're, you're, you look Hispanic, but I know you're not Hispanic, I guess, because of the music I was listening to or something. And uh, it was like uh, some native rock and roll. And, um, and I said, uh, well, how do you identify yourself? And he's like, I don't know, man, I guess, you know, I'm, hispanic or whatever i was like no what's your race and he's like what do you mean i was like yeah what's your race like racially how do you identify so i broke it down i said are you white are you asian are you black or are you native american which of the those four races uh are you and he just stood there and looked for a little bit and he got it quick he's like well i'm native american process of elimination you know he used process of elimination he's like well native american I was all like, man, I gave him five. I was like, man, you got that so much quicker than so many other people. So we had a like a 20 minute conversation and he was just like blown away. Like he didn't know that much about his, his history. But um, so to incorporate what Manuel was saying, what Dr. Samaripa was saying about um, uh, not having, we don't, we can't just go back to living how our ancestors did. We're using the tools that we have at hand to, in order to survive because that's what we know for now. And that's okay. Because remember, this is about surviving. But why is identity important in this if you just want to get along with a big system? And it's like, hey, let's not rock the boat. You know, it really doesn't matter. Well, how are you going to raise your children? Are you going to create another generation of children uh, who are going to be bumping around like pinballs in a pinball machine, not knowing who they are? Because remember, we're talking about community and people are always going to look for a community or uh, they want to belong, you know, whether it's in a family or not. So to the average brown person who just says, look, I'm Mexican-American, this doesn't matter to me. Well, it, it matters to all of us, you know. You know, uh, I don't think we can afford another generation of, of uh, children or people not knowing who they are, calling themselves things that they are not because what was done to the African people by calling them the N-word, it was done intentionally to lower their station in life. So the same thing with us, they're gonna call us anything except Native American or recognize who we are because again, we're gonna set that process in motion. It's gonna create a giant debate, a conversation that cannot be denied about stolen land and mass murder. You know, so it's like, are you gonna, are we gonna have? Are you just want to get? Are you just want to get along with your barbecues and, and and you know just go to work and not you know pay my taxes and uh, you know you know be with my family and just you know get along? But how are you living? You know, in other words, are you living an illusion or are you living a lie? You know, because historically many of us don't know who we are. And they don't know that they're living a lie, that they're living this illusion that, you know, who their ancestors are, you know, so, and it is a choice. It is a choice for everyone to make, but, you know, we're asking them to think about it. Uh, do you want your children to live that lie, not know who they are and continue for, you know, their, your children and their children and their children to continue to be submissive to a foreign people, foreigners colonizers, invaders, who, whose ancestors enslaved our ancestors, you know? Are we gonna allow ourselves to continue that, 
that that uh that way of life you know it is important many of us don't feel it because we've been we've been made so comfortable we've been spoiled by the invaders <laughs> you know with all you know uh just to keep us you know just to keep us uh calm complacent and unquestioning so i think it's important you know just stand back and see the big picture your children's lives depend on this their children's lives depend on this you know create a generation of warriors young men and women who are going to question and are going to stand up and we can turn this chain of events around completely i think you know with every generation that's born that's born knowing you know really good question it's hard to tackle that sometimes because you know yeah it can feel like um you know like insulting like you're insulting my way of life i'm providing a good life for my family here you know and you're saying it's a lie you know so so really trying to to unpack that and and see you know no you nobody's saying you're not living in a good way right we're just saying that um identity matters so that you can know who you are and know that you can have more and i don't mean ownership of more things you know manuel and i were talking about modernity you know and um and and distinguishing uh modernity from colonization um the risk of buying into this modernity like you said being comfortable uh but is it enough when our brothers our sisters and our siblings are are, are suffering and are marginalized and are disconnected um from from flourishing and not just surviving right it, is it enough right to not be responsible for each other and this all starts with identity right and again you know we're not trying to convert anybody into like you know being saying you're native and then then there's that whole discussion that we had last time about do i even have the right to connect no it's about just beginning planting the seeds of knowing who you are beginning the investigation uh, Manuel, did you want to, uh, what, what is your take on this? Well, there's like 10 points I could pick up on, you know, else, like, so many different pieces. Um, but I think one of the things I, I, I heard you saying um, at the beginning was, um, well, going back to that, you know, like, this is my life, I'm doing well, um, you know, we relax on the weekends, you know, we have barbecues and, you know, we go to the mall and, and all of that, again, you know, that's not an evil thing, right? It, the idea is um, at all in and of itself. Um, the, the thing is, have we thought about what that means? Have we considered um, if that's the direction we still want to go? Um, is there something else that we need to, to do differently um, in our lives? Uh, and one of the things I think is that 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 happens in this uh, kind of in this society um, has always been this cutting off from your past. Your past doesn't matter. Move forward. Um, and and if we just think about that, um, you know, that was always a big thing in, in this country. Was that it doesn't matter where you come from. It matters where you're going. Don't worry about it. Well, the implication there always is that the past always weighs you down. That was always a negative implication without even thinking about it. And then if you just think in the natural world, in anything, that's basically saying the roots don't matter. Well, what happens when you cut off roots from a tree? You know, I mean, it, it's not going to survive. You need, you need the past. You need to know where you come from. You need to have those roots to grow in a healthy way. So you need both. We need this balance. And, uh, and, and what I was thinking about is kind of this reconnecting to, to uh, our, our native identity, reconnecting to who we were prior to the invasion. Um, again, it's not an artificial like, well, let's go back. We, we can't go back in time, you know, but what we do is we have this accumulation of history and, and community and culture and now that we know better, we do better, and we add to that. So that I, you know, in 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 my reconnection and in others, um, we 
we try to live in a good way, but I don't pretend that like I still, you know, um, don't love my, you know, when I hear mariachi music, I'm like, oh, that's so great. I love, I mean, it really like it connects because I have that, that, that cultural memory and it's a cultural pride. And, and mariachis don't have anything to do with our native connectedness, not, not directly, right? Um, but um, I have an awareness of what that means now. I still like my, you know, the Hano Tex-Mex music, you know, it's part of something that I still connect to. Um, but I recognize also connecting to the ways in which, you know, um, my other community and my other brothers and sisters and siblings, you know, express themselves through music, for example. So you broaden and you reconnect to other ways of it. Because what, you, what happens is that when you do that, you hear things that you don't hear with, this, uh, with other things. You know, people are expressing their lives in ways that um, aren't expressed if we, just, if we just cut ourselves off from the things that we're only used to. So I guess what I'm saying is that it's about moving on and expanding and including what we know uh, and what we know now. Um, and when we do that, then, um, then we can, we, we have broader experiences. So now with our kids, they have seen and heard more than what I saw and heard as a child, right? And so then we move in that direction. Um, so if it's we don't about a both our, and. It's about a both and, but also with a critical awareness, you know, not just the acceptance of everything, like, you know, like I'm accepting everything. I, uh, I realize like mariachi music is an example. I mean, my dad was in a trio, he played the guitaron. It's a really special piece, but I also realize, you know, where that came from, you know, and I, and I can understand that. And I can understand that, you know, there was that Spanish influence in there. Um, um, but where I am, who I am now, um, I don't know if three generations from now that that'll still be part of our identity, the identity of my family. It may be more of a, you know, every, uh, you know, another thing that's helpful is the, the way things move in the world has its time, has its cycle, right? So, so it's not about the linear way of Western ways of looking at time, like going back in time again and, and changing everything. It's about things that will come back around again. And the more we move in this direction, the more that we can come back around to the wisdoms that our people had. And it's not gonna be where we pretend the last you know, 500 years didn't happen. It's gonna be with the knowledge of what happened the last 500 years, right? But still coming back around, moving toward a more, a more authentic self. So we know culture is evolving, right? It's a living thing. <clears throat> And then we can find ways to incorporate all of these parts of who we are, right? Um, and eliminate the damaging parts though, right? Eliminate the parts that, you know. Right, which is what we're trying to do. Is. So I have um, something that I know people have been asking. Well, two things. Um, one, uh, it's been asked, well, well, okay. We should, I, and we're coming short on time. Gosh, did we say an hour and a half? Because we always go over. <laughs> So it's going to be, go, let's go over a little bit. <laughs> okay, good. Let's go over. And those of you who need to get off, get off and you can watch it later. Right. <clears throat> but, um, so, uh, it's such an important conversation. So, um, people get confused. They say, I have white friends. They're nice. They're friendly. They really help my family in a hard time. You know, there's good families in the community. That is true. And people gentrifying neighborhoods, you know, that are taking it for themselves. They're not monsters. They're just trying to get a house in the city that they like, and, and they're just trying to raise their family. So are those white people monsters? No, they're benefiting from the fact that they had uh, more access to education, more access to income, more access to all kinds of things that made them able to take over those houses on the east side or on all of Austin or, or really a lot of cities everywhere um, and rural also buy up the land. <clears throat> so, so they had those opportunities, but does that mean they're mean? Does that mean they're monsters? That's where people get confused. Um, no. And 
if the power structure started to shift to where where um, we were able to to have our land, uh, then there would be some shifts in in perspective, right? So here's the thing: Do we need to? Um, we're confused, some of us, right? Because we don't want to, and we don't think of the people, white people that we know, the white families as as monsters. Does this conversation mean you have to think that way? How do we tease that out? Because people think just because we're we're learning about our identity, we're we're you know having an ethnic pride, we're having a an understanding of who we are racially, that then we have to to think that way about white people. Um, can we? What would we say to those people that are confused with those two separate things? Um, who wants to start first, Yowie? Um, no, maybe uh, Dr. Samarripa. Okay, and then yeah, you can have time to to collect your thoughts about that, um, Dr. Samarripa, because that's always that always comes up. People are are like, what you know? They're just living regular lives uh, and don't understand the connection to to how we're living our lives. Did you want to? I know that's a tough one to tackle, and we're not gonna like you said. We don't need to get to the answers here, but. But we do need to start no, the conversation. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I I got to think about how to say it, like uh, you know, diplomatically. So I'm gonna I'm gonna ask Dr. Tamaripa to. <laughs> okay. Uh, no, no. Um, there's several things that come up. Um, okay, so villainizing. Um, well, that's really never the question. That's really not the the area to speak from, um, like gentrification and all that. That is a part, again, as I was saying, of a community, a society that doesn't value history. Um, so um, I'm sorry, it, it, is, it is bigger than just, I wanna buy a better house for my family. And, uh, and you know, here's a good example that fits into what, what has now become accepted in the larger, the larger societal structures, right? Recycling. Remember when recycling, some of you, maybe not all of you, I remember when people were pissed off, politicians, regular people, middle-class white people, upper-class white people, poor people that didn't have time to separate, you know, it was a huge deal um, to just incorporate recycling bins, to recycle. Um, it was inconvenient. It was ridiculous for some. And I'll also, I'll also say for our people, really, actually, we were always recycling. I mean, how many times did a coffee pot turn into a bowl? How many times did we, we were always reusing things because we had to out of necessity. So for us, on a side note, that whole inconvenience of recycling into bins was convenient, but our families always recycled everything. You know, that was, again, one of the things that, that we were always doing, right? <laughs> um, but that became part of that became part of the now what people do. And the the line was, you know, the activism that won out was to the people that it had a hard time with it, too bad. Like this is what we need to do. So for gentrification, like it's kind of like you have to think about that. You, you're displacing people. Yeah, but I didn't mean to. I'm sure about well, we all need to think about it, you know. So it's not about pointing the finger at a particular race, you know, whoever displaces another people from their land needs to think about the fact that they're displacing people from their land, right? Historically, we have certain groups that have been doing that more often than not, but it's about the principle of the matter, right? So um, that's one thing too. It's not about villainizing, but the anger that we have is justified. And so if you wanna join us in that anger, and help change the system. That that's you know, that's fantastic. Um, even within our own communities, right? Um, so, anger is not the enemy of progress necessarily. Um, you know, it just depends on what where that anger comes from and what we're doing with it, and that we balance it. We can't always be fueled by anger, but anger can have its place. We justified anger can have its place. So again not necessarily about villainizing, it's about what's happening and how we respond to, to what's happening. Um, and the, the other thing that I was thinking about is, um, is kind of what we talk about 
every once in a while, and I think I think Yawi brings this up, I think even earlier, um, is that we need to focus on what we're doing ourselves. We need to have an in, we need to have our circles with us about what we want to do. So, and if what's important to us is reclaiming who we are and, and, and making sure that we're moving forward as a community. And when we, when we act in that way, it's gonna seem disruptive to the structures that are in place. Um, so I think point. we need to spend a little less time, you know, we, we understand the structures that are in place, but less time with our energy outward and more time with our energy inward. And the more that we do that, the more that we do that, you know, um, one of the things that, that, that we know in, in, in uh, you know, in, in, the, in the research is that, is that people that feel closer to their cultural identity are actually, you know, more positive, they have a healthier lifestyle, they're better, they're more successful, whatever that means. And so connecting to who we are culturally has benefits with for ourselves and for our community and who we are. So I think that's that's our focus. Um, we're talking a lot these days about white privilege and calling out white privilege and calling out white supremacy, and uh, that's becoming you know a topic of that we're hearing more and more of. And I think that's Tlasatiani. Uh, that's part of what you're saying is you know before it would be like, hey, aren't we? you know, saying that all white people are bad, all white people are this. Well, um, people are now talking about the fact that if we're benefiting from a certain system, then we need to change that system, that there is that privilege, that there is, the, there is that kind of supremacy that is already innate in the structure. And once you have the machine built and, you know, the next generation takes over the machine, all they have to do is just slide into the position. That's the, that's the thing about building a machine of oppression is the people that built the machine, put it in place, they, they, they do the damage. And then what's, once the structure's in place, then it just passes down. So the people that keep that machine running may not always be aware of the machine that they keep going, but, um, but, but, but we need to be aware. It's, it's important. Otherwise, otherwise, how are we gonna share this earth uh, if we're not being authentic in who's doing what, where, how things were set up. Um, so. Right. We can be polite, not to be rude, right? Um, to point out the things that are happening to our families, our communities, and that have been happening as, as Gawi showed us that timeline before. <clears throat> and also, I think, uh, I like what you said, that's a really good analogy about just sliding into place, right? And continuing because the contemporary you know in this contemporary coloniality people are like I'm not a villain those were my ancestors I didn't do it you're continuing to benefit and not hold yourself accountable and even our own our own people you know I'll go on the mom groups or different groups somebody dares to mention race right racism and our own people will get on there and shoot them down like oh brother I'm Mexican and I I can't believe you you're saying this this has nothing to do with race because they don't understand the connections with which these things are affecting each other, our daily lives, right? We've spent this whole um, platica talking about these connections, these invisible connections. You think you're just living, you know, you got this job this is a job you got, and this is how you're raising your family. You don't realize why you didn't have access to better work or access to land to grow your own vegetables or to even know how we ancestrally did that. Um, on and on and on and on. So I like that we're separating out like just because we're having these discussions doesn't mean, you know, we're saying these other things that are that are put onto us, right, that are automatically attached to these conversations, it's why it feels divisive and other people feel like it's divisive, right? And then we have the other perspective that Perla brought up in, in this platica here, she's one of the people watching that she said, well, on the other hand, you know, don't Native people think that we're you know, we're, we're being disrespectful by, by calling ourselves Native. So you've got so much to unpack from every angle, you know, no wonder where we don't want to take it on. It's so big of a conversation. This is part two. And we still have, again, raised so many questions and we could have a part three, part four, part five, you know, because there's so much to figure out. 
but um, but I'm glad we're asking the hard questions like, what what is our perspective? You know, I don't want to, you know, say that my white neighbors that I've known for 20 years and helped me out are bad. So what am I doing here? Um, Kiawid, uh, what what did you what would you like to say about this topic? Um, I want to draw in two uh, two scenarios or two examples uh, to put uh, together like what how we should view uh, or the the whole deal with like white people and gentrification and all that and um, okay there's an elder that we all know from South Texas I'm not going to mention his name but uh, he told me that he was approached by a white uh, professor or student from uh, some university who knew that he had uh, access to uh, resources about the, the so-called peyote religions or customs among uh, our people in South Texas, all the way up to the tribes who now use it uh, in Oklahoma. And the, the, he knew that, you know, he was the key there, the entrance for this professor to have access to talking to uh, some of the, the native elders up in uh, Oklahoma over there on the reservation. And uh, he said, he said, he told me, he was like, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, vent, I'm gonna check him out. I'm gonna see what he's all about. So he, he threw a question at him. He said, uh, hey, so-and-so, so, -and -so, so um, what do white people tell their children in order to be successful? When he said, the guy thought about it for a while. He says, you know what? We don't tell them anything. We just hand it over to them. So think about that, okay? Think about how the resources are just handed over to them. So they, it's a continual inheritance Wow. from 1492 to today, okay? Now we're gonna draw on another scenario here. What happens when there's a large group of people and we're gonna use uh, the, the, the things that have been happening out on the streets when a policeman beats a, a black man or any person, a large group of people are gonna get infuriated and get close and they're gonna be angry, upset, and they're gonna be yelling like, leave them alone or leave her alone, don't do that, you know? So we have to say, that's been, that's our situation since 1492, being beat and the other ones on the other side, screaming and yelling, don't hit them, don't kill them, don't hurt her, don't kill them, or whatever. And that's the anger that comes with what is going on. And it's natural. You know, anger is part of the grieving process. First we're in denial, then we come around and we're like, you know what, it's true. Then we become angry and infuriated and we move on until, you know, we reach like, I think there's like five steps. I don't know if it's the correct, uh, you know, uh, number of uh, steps in the grievance process, but we come to closure and acceptance. But in this case, this is generational. A lot of us are angry because we are beginning to remember and we're infuriated and it's a natural reaction, but we cannot get stuck there because it is dangerous. And yes, we have to. So if we're present and we're witnessing something horrifying, a crime taking place, something violent, we're going to be appalled, we're going to be angry, we're going to be upset. So when we see white people gentrifying, that comes from that memory we have where we remember, it's like, these are the same people who took my ancestors' land. You know, in other words, 99% of the crimes committed against all brown Native American people in the Western Hemisphere, when we identify the culprit, 99% of the time, we're gonna see a white face attached to it. So yes, it is natural to be angry, you know, and there is a righteous type of anger, I think, I don't know who talked about that, but, and it's valid. And we need to go through the grieving process. But when we, when we come to closure, it's not about accepting our an, an enslaved position. We have to identify the culprits. We have to identify the people who continue to benefit from the rape, theft, and murder, no matter how indirect it was. And we have to identify the invaders and their descendants today who continue to benefit from this in many ways. You know? Yes, there are... We, you know, and it, this is where the tables turn, where white people you say, no, I'm not racist, I have a black friend. No, I'm not racist, because I have a white friend, I have white friends too. And I have these conversations with them. They ask me, hey, you know those things you say on social media about white people? You know, why do you say that? I was like, 
are you going to deny, are you going to deny it's the truth? And then we have a long discussion. They say, you know what? Yeah, my family comes from Europe. You're right. And I have, some of my ancestors did this or they did that. Like some of them are brave enough to address that, which is good. Because then we come, we, we, we're, now we're going to be on a level playing field. We're like, okay, now you know why, why you are in the position you're in. Now you know why I'm upset. You know, now you know why I'm doing what I'm doing and why I think the way I'm thinking, you know? So this is, the Western Hemisphere is a giant crime scene and everybody's upset because they know what's going on. But it's, we're still part of that denial. It's like, you know, we got to attach, we got to identify the culprits, the perpetrators of these crimes, you know? And the perpetrators of these crimes include the people who are illegally holding on to stolen land and resources, you know, they are part, you know, they are not disconnected from it. You know, they, they are benefactors of mass murder. And that's a fact. We have to address these facts. But it's dangerous to get caught in the angry position because I think the people in power, the current European system on our land, they want us to react out of emotion and out of anger because they have millions of empty jail cells waiting for brown and black Asian people, you know, and even white, of course. And they have, they have the ammunition, the gun, and they have the power to lock us up and abuse us in any way, shape or form for the most part, you know? So there are many tools at our disposal to get around falling into that trap. That's why they want us to fight them on their level, you know? We need That's another to reason to know. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, we just need to go be around that, beyond it, and and use the tools that we know, the the, the resources we have at hand. You know. You know. Oh, I'm sorry. I just you're saying so many things. You're right. I mean, there's those jail cells, and there it's a big money maker, and we, you know we've been disproportionately. Um, uh, there because yeah because of this um passed down trauma right that we haven't know, ha known how to heal or know who we are and connect with in a good way and you know again anger you know gandhi was angry martin luther king was angry angry emma tenayuka was angry dolores huerta was angry um cesar chavez was angry it's about knowing how to to use that in a good way right um to make shifts that that we need to make so this discussion is, is incredible. Again, I know it's so much to sift through. And um, so it's 1236. And, um, and I think that it's going to take time. Maybe we're going to have to watch this again, right? Um, so be thinking about, I'm going to ask another question. And, and Manuel and Yaoi, be thinking about, you know, what, uh, last things you would want to say, and then we can talk about it. We're going to have a part three. <laughs> and um, so, so be thinking about that. As I ask this one question, um, how do we unify <laughs> the age old question, right? The, the people that are working and just, you know, providing and, and making a good life, right? The best that they can. And, and those of us who have been raising children for a long time and I remember looking out the door at, at the grocery store and thinking if I could make it from the checkout counter to steal the <clears throat> Pedialyte that one of my children needed for their fever because I didn't have enough money for it right and it was really hard to get through the food stamp system like trying to see if I would make it out the door or would it be worse if I get arrested and then there's nobody to take care of my child right with that fever so I I, I just did my best and found a way to buy by asking, right? Asking somebody to help me. Not the first person help me, not the second person help me. So think about that, right? Like um, thinking about, I, I like to bring, because we talk about big ways and little ways that that knowing who we are and, and getting strong with their identity affects us, right? <clears throat> so, so unifying, right? All these different people, like the guy in the at the dump, right? Who's like, had no clue, you know? A lot of people don't know our history. And a lot of people think we're, we're trying to cause trouble, right? To talk about who we are and, and know how to identify ourselves and think about identity. So um, 
how do we unify? Is there an answer to that question? Why do we want to unify? Can everybody just go off and do it their own way? Um, um, those of us, you know, that are identify as Mexican American, Chicano, um, just connect culturally, not even think about being native or people that are on the different areas of the spectrum of acculturation, assimilation, even that strongly reject connecting culturally, you know, because of internalized depression and, and the way we've been socialized and taught, right, in the school system. So question is, do we unify? How do we unify? Why would we unify? Um, who wants then, to? Um, Dr. Samaripa, please. Okay, I'm go ahead. I'm just gonna step away from the phone a sec, like five seconds. Sure, sure. Yeah, I've been stepping away to, to deal with my little son who's been getting so loud. I hope y'all didn't hear him. <laughs> okay, Dr. Samaripa, uh, if you want to answer the question about unifying? Sure, yeah, just let me just, uh, you know, that's the the million dollar question, right? Yeah. That's the one that we're always uh, talking about. Um, I think I think one of the things oh. that I think about again is um, realizing that unifying as a people can mean different things already. That's already, you know, different things in different ways to different people. So uh, it's, it, it's already going to be something that we need to recognize that it's not going to be one. I don't think we should have our come. I don't think we can come to the one answer amongst all of us about what it means to unify. But I think um, that the way we began is, um, is being more connect, trying to find ways to be more connected uh, on issues that impact all of us and realizing that we're all in it together. Um, so for example, there's many, but I, I remember, um, Proposition 187 in California in 1994 was one of the, these first more modern, uh, the, the, the beginning of um, this kind of legal intolerance um, for our migrants, um, people where there was going to be um, kind of like in, in Arizona, the show me your papers, right? In Arizona, they had the SB 10, 1080. Um, and so Proposition 87 was like that, you know, that, that they were checking, uh, it never actually went into law, but you know, when it was passed, it was gonna be, you know, teachers could check the legal status of children and, and police could check the legal status and there weren't gonna be any health benefits, doctor benefits for people depending on their legal status. Uh, and in Arizona, show me the papers kind of, you know, laws. What's important about that is that we had people that, you know, even in our community that were divided in that issue. But what we need to realize is that um, people that are flared up, you know, they, they, they say the laws very politely. They're like, well, this is about protecting people. You know, or this is not a, against anybody. We need to make sure that people are, you know, politicians know how to, 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 to do that, take the emotion out of it, right? Um, to get it through you know, to a broad base. Um, but what that does is it stirs a hatred. It stirs people that are already inclined to, to, to have that xenophobia and all that. And my, my point is that, you know, we can be fourth generation. We can be, you know, from South, so-called South America, we can move, but the people implementing those laws, those, those eyes, if you will, don't make those distinctions, right? And then we're, we're offended, like, I can't believe they stopped me. I'm a citizen, I'm a, you know, all that can be true. But when you give power to those type of issues that affect all of us, um, then we're always, gonna, we're always gonna be on the losing end. So what I'm saying is that what's part of unity is us recognizing the things that are happening to us that we may not think affect us directly. Oh, that's, you know, them, that's that part. They can impact all of us, they affect all of us on principle, um, you know, and um, finding ways to come together when those, those, those incidents, those issues come up and realizing 
that, you know, I may be on this side or that side, but this can impact me. It's like that, um, that, that story that I think we're all now familiar with, um, um, where, um, that had to do with, you know, Nazi Germany, right? Where there were like so many people, um, where they first came for the Jew, the Jews, but I wasn't Jew, so I didn't say anything. And then they came for, you know, these people, the Christians, but I wasn't Christian, so I didn't say anything, you know, and they, they just keep going. And finally, that person at the end is like, you know, and then they came for me, I was the only one there, and there was no one to stand up for me. So they took me too, right? So we're always, even within ourselves, finding the ways that we're different from each other, you know, whether it's generational mm -hmm. status, whether That's it's important. legal status, whatever, whatever. And that is just the wrong way to, to think about when we're thinking about our community. There's already enough things out there that show how we're distinct from each other. We need to realize the ways in which um, the, these issues impact all of us. Um, and the more that we can make those connections, you know, my, my, my answer, <laughs> my long-winded answer is that I think unity begins in action, not in theory, you know, not in, in trying to find the ways that we can see how we're not so different from each other. It, the unity begins in the times where we show up for each other, where somebody, when we ask for help, we help each other. And then that becomes imprinted in our memory, you know, like that we came together. And that leaves a memory, it's an experience that then trickles down to our personal lives. So that when we see a brother or sister or sibling in trouble, like, you know, on the side of the road or whatever, where one, you know, where at one point in our life, we might be inclined to be like, oh, I feel sorry for that person, but when we keep going, now we'll, we'll stop and we'll, we'll, we'll realize that they are part of us and we are part of them. Why? Because we had a previous experience of coming together and, and coming together in action, you know, you know, may or may not mean coming together physically, but it may mean taking part in something because we realize we're in it together. Um, and again, coming together doesn't, isn't the same thing as excluding others. That's one thing we have to get through our heads. Saying that we're going to come together with each other doesn't mean that we're saying we're not going to come, you know, be there for somebody else. Like we have to learn to separate those things. So, um, okay, it's twelve forty-six, and one thing that we did not, uh, Kiawe, I'm going to ask you to answer that same question about unity, but I also want to put in both of your minds and in all of our minds that we did not discuss anti-indigenous attitudes. Um, anti-indigenous, anti-native attitudes alive in our community, right? Beyond skin color, um, not just negative attitudes towards darker skin, but anything that is connected to our native ways of life. Um, do we as a community here feel like we have the energy to tackle that? Do we want to put it in the next one? Do we want to um, it's heavy, it's dense uh, stuff we've been talking about? Um, what is your you're thinking on that. Do we want to discuss it now or next time? Maybe we should ask our listeners or, uh, and, mm -hmm. um, and uh, if they're okay with it, or we can go on and, you know, they, they're, you know, we don't want to eat up, monopolize or eat up their whole day, but uh, right. maybe we can just <laughs> record it. Or we can do a part three much sooner because I, I saw a lot of good questions that we haven't touched on yet, like the the term mestizo and the immigrant yeah. and migrant and uh, yeah. maybe up to three. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it's been pretty loaded, you know? Yeah. Uh, community, yeah. what do y'all think? Do y'all want to do it in a part three or do you want to go longer here? Go ahead and give your palabra, um, anybody here, if you want to, what you think? Or also, Manuel, what do you think? We're getting some things in the chat, and so I think. Okay, um, people are saying part three. Yeah, this has been a lot. It's it's always a very dense conversation. There's a lot of connections to be made, and a lot of decolonizing our own thinking and taking off the Western lens, right, and putting on our our own lens as a people that takes time. So so people are saying part three, part three, part three. Um, so like you said, Kiawe, there's a lot of questions we didn't even get to, <laughs> and we can just you know, add to the questions uh, or just handle these next time. So we'll cover um, anti-Indigenous attitudes next time. 
Um, so then, is that is that okay with everybody? Are we in agreement? Yeah, I think so. Uh, a lot of the re your listeners are a lot of the listeners said part three. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think so we're all in agreement. We can make a whole show out of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we can. Okay, because it's real. There's a lot. We're not making anything up. Um, so, okay, so then, Gawi, back to that last question, uh, unity. Do we want to? Why would we do it? Um, why of course. Why we, yeah, go ahead. I mean, for obvious reasons, you know, when a giant school of fish teams up against one single shark, you know, and uh, that image that we've seen. But I want to draw two examples from a, what, a movie. Uh, it's from the book, uh, Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee by d brown and i recommend people watching the movie but on unity two points uh in the movie i don't know if they're historically factual but it's very telling of the divisiveness that we we're infected with and the use of uh uh the the infection of the analytic mindset from europeans the divide to invade and conquer using division and intrigue so uh, there was this one part in the movie where uh, there's a, uh, a village or uh, there's already a town built near the reservation up in South Dakota near the Lakota reservation. And on the wall, it said on one of the walls, somebody painted every man a chief. OK, so hold on to that for a while. Right. Every man a chief. And then in another part of the movie, when the, the massacre by the United States Cavalry against uh, the Lakota at Wounded Knee, there was this one scene in the movie where uh, one of the main characters comes out who's a doctor now under the Western worldview medicine and uh, he, he studied that type of medicine. He came out and there was a sergeant, uh, some one of the officers who had rank and he started going to him and telling him, look, it wasn't our fault. We didn't shoot first. Man, it's, you know, he looked very distressed, the white man, the soldier that officer and uh uh the guy who is playing red cloud red cloud speaks and tells him he's all why do you worry so much white man or do not worry so much white man do not be upset he saw it is your bullets that we feared the least so that made me think what is it that our ancestors feared the most that the europeans brought you know if we went to war and after we, a lot of the men were, a, a lot of men lost their lives. You know, they said, this isn't going to work. Obviously, they weren't afraid of the bullets are going to, to fight on, on many fronts. I think what they feared the most was the, the being infected by, by several things. Uh, divisiveness, you know, difference, uh, greed, and fear. I think those are the greatest diseases that our people have always, like, were at odds with and fighting not only among within themselves but among themselves to keep a community going so when you have the propaganda being imposed on everyone every man a chief you destroy a system you destroy an order that a people had there is no longer uh, a system where the the authority and the way that a society conducts itself uh, uh, for thousands of years and they found a way that worked for them you know, you need to destroy that in order to to maintain uh, dominance over a people. You make you tell everyone, every man, every woman, a chief or a chiefess. You you have them at odds with one another for power struggles. That's where we're at right now. So it's hard to achieve unity because with the topic of identity, with the topic of identity. Sorry about that. Um, with the topic of identity. We have everyone at odds trying to to flex their their uh, their knowledge, their muscles of knowledge, trying to be correct, trying to be right, politically correct, trying to be acceptable. Everyone's in a contest to trying for you know trying to be right with the right words. When I think one of your your uh, your listeners said like, "What is the common bond that holds us? Our blood, our genetics, our race, Native American." Shed peel all the layers back. And down inside, we're Native Americans. If we're not white, if we're not Asian, if we're not black, we're Native American. Nobody can deny your race, no matter how do tribalized or colonized or assimilated we are, okay? 
at least on that aspect, on the racial blood genetic aspect. If you have a, a, a male and female tiger in the zoo, and if they if they have uh, if they have tigers and their offspring are born in captivity, they continue to be tigers. They are not anything else. And nobody can tell you that you're no longer that just because you were born in captivity. You were born enslaved and assimilated with a colonized warped mind because that's that's where many of us are coming from. And that's why we're having these discussions. You know, so unity is important. And plus, unity, unification, coming together, it's it's a natural human trait. It's in our blood. It's in our genes. I read uh, in Geronimo's autobiography, which is very interesting. He said that when people began to, people within their, their village or their community who became disruptive, uh, if they refused to be part of the community, they were ousted. And he said these ousted people from other communities, they formed their own communities. So, I mean, it's natural, you know, it's natural to form communities, natural to seek the people that you know that you're going to connect with because we that's what we have in us that's how we were created to seek that have that longing and that need to connect with one another because that i mean everything's connected you know and it was always on us to find that that connection and we've that's been a struggle within us to to connect you know and to achieve harmony you know john trudell said it in that in one of his poems you know uh on his first recorded album, he said the people have always struggled to achieve harmony in one form or another because it does it does require work. But now it's a lot harder because we we've taken on the analytic mindset of breaking things up, you know, in order to to understand them and say instead of seeing the greater whole and the power of coming back to become a greater whole. Because when we stand back and see the big picture separation is just an illusion and one thing that I learned is alone one can go fast but together we can go far and I think that togetherness is more important than just thinking of ourselves you know it's that egocentric selfish mindset that we've been uh, contaminated with where it's just the me 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 I can do this I want this I want that I'm this you know, instead of just listening to everybody and coming together on, on that one common ground that, you know, we're Native American, you know? And no matter how detribalized we are, we are gonna look for our tribe. We're gonna look to form community in one way or another. So it's natural and, and we just need to let it happen, you know? And again, the unifying, this is all about surviving, okay? Because together, I mean, that's the only way we're going to make this happen, you know, when we come together and unify and thank forget you. our little differences. Yeah, thank you for that. That's actually part of our primal brain our, our, uh, um, is, is being tribal, being together, <clears throat> coming together. We talk about that a lot with the Institute of Chicano Psychology about um, individualism, right, and collectivism and, and, um, and the things that that, that creates. Um, so we're coming to an end. Uh, Shirley, if you want to ask the last question briefly, and we'll answer it briefly. I think all of our brains are tired and we need to <laughs> stretch. Yeah, I just, our I just wanted to add, add one comment. Thank you so much for the invitation. And this uh, conversation is so fruitful for me. It is a much desired conversation. Uh, for Latinos all over the United States today. I have a couple of things to add. And that is, is that I think that one of the strategies that African-Americans have done is their point of origin, which is 1619. So they're basing their argument for reparations on the point of 1619. And that would be very useful for Latinos to think about our point of origin, possibly 1419, right? Uh, the moment of colonization. Uh, what I wanna say what I had added in the chat was what is our basis for alliance because I, I do face uh, 
if you want to call it frustration, about knowing how to unify us, we are almost ununifiable. You want to remember the 2000 clans lived in the uh, Americas, right? Canada, US, Latin America. We were not a unified force when the colonizer arrived. We were, we were broken up into individual clans. That is not that we didn't live side by side and have a similar cultural framework. We were indigenous, right? Uh, there were a lot of uh, similar tenants. However, what we want to think about is coalition work. We want to realize that a basis for alliance, what is that going to be? We have to create that. But the second thing is we have to think about coalition work, which means that coalition work means we're not going to feel good together all the time. Coalition work means that we're going to disagree. Coalition work means that we're going to be divided by class, language, immigration, history, region, everything, you know? But so it's an awareness that what we get together to argue for what we're going for, and then we disperse, and then we get together again to argue again for what we're going for again, and then we disperse. Um, it's going to be too hard for the entire continent of indigenous people, this Canada, you know, for all of us to see ourselves similarity. Uh, Rigo Bertha Menchur has done a fabulous job of rooting that indigenous identity, right? So, but but like Alex was talking about, there's, a, and, and Dr. Manuel, there's a huge, huge bridge between what Rigo Bertha Menchu has done and, uh, others who have been uh, generationally colonized, so we don't even see our indigenous roots, right? It would be as though blacks uh, were given privilege based on their color of their skin, the shade of their skin. In fact, we have, as Latinos, been privileged on the fact that we're here six generations, on the fact that we went to university, on the fact that we speak English, on the fact that we live in suburbs, you know, we are already divided in these ways. So Alex, you're, you're so right. We need to reclaim, uh, imagine, desire, much like the muralists are doing. What is our rooted uh, consciousness? Where, where, where were we first united? And try to imagine how we can return to that moment to moment, not not a, it's not a, never going to be a consistent al alliance, but but only a lie to organize our vote, only a lie to organize our schools, only a lie to organize our cultural framework. So those are just a few of my ideas this morning. But this conversation is rich. This conversation is essential and so needed. If Latinos are going to formulate themselves into any kind of cultural, political, economic block, whatever we're going to do, this conversation is the first conversation really that I've heard that um, I can relate to. It's not academic. I don't want academic. I'm a PhD. I don't really want that. They're not moving us, okay? Alex, I love that you come from an indigenous framework because that, that is really, really what's moving us, okay? So that's my comment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shirley, for your palabra. Thank you for adding to the conversation. Thank you all of you for your presence, for your hearts, like we always say, and for your, you know, your thinking, right? Your decolonizing. And uh, thank you to everybody who put into the chat. And um, so for all of our community, right? That I know these are hard things to, to hear and to talk about and to figure out sometimes. So, so Brown Continent um, is here too, if you want to further the, you know, Kiawit, ask more questions. And Dr. Samaripa and myself with the Institute for Chicano Psychology, um, we can do that again. And we will have a part three much sooner. <laughs> we won't take nine oh. months to the next one, but it was a nine months of gestation of ideas, right? <laughs> so, <That's> okay. <laughs> so if you want to say your parting words, um, Kiawit and Dr. Samaripa. Um, yeah, Leda, I, would, uh, I would like to go so Dr. Samaripa can close. Um, and uh, uh, I want to thank all of you, uh, all the readers, all the all the followers of uh, Chicano Psychology, all the listeners who stayed, and the ones who got on and had to get off for various reasons. Uh, thank you all for listening to uh, this conversation. Um, thank you, Tlasaltiani and Dr. Samarripa, uh, for for allowing us to you know to come onto your platform and and share this, you know, share the, you know, 
part of the, a great awakening that's happening. We're living in very interesting times because uh, when I began to remember back in 2003 who, who I am, um, you know, I thought I was alone. And you, when you go on social media, uh, there's millions, millions, I mean, thousands and thousands of like uh, people like, like us uh, beginning to remember. And I think we just have to be very careful. We have to be very careful because the, uh, the current uh, descendants of the colonizers, the invaders, they're aware of this. They're aware that we're, you know, eventually we're gonna have to come around and remember who we are and wake up. And we have to realize that coloniz colonization will never last forever. It can't last forever. Look at South Africa, look at India, they're still recuperating, but it can't last forever. Look at all the overthrown colony kingdoms around the world. You know, yes, there's a lot of damage that needs to be repaired, but why would they want to build a wall across the Southern apartheid border? Because we, because of our majority status, we are a threat. Uh, we crunch some numbers and all brown Native American people from the Western hemisphere, uh, when, uh, tribalized or detribalized, make up 67% of the population of the entire Western hemisphere. You look around, are the majority of the people in the Western hemisphere black? No, are they Asian? No, are they white? No. We have to ask that question, who are they? It's us, because we're the pe we're Turtle Islanders, we're native people, we're Indians, we're from the Western hemisphere, when America, you know? And I speak in these generalities to be able, so that people can um, understand what we're talking about. I'm not gonna be into like, you know, I can't, let's not go into like tribal names, you know, not, we're not there yet. And, uh, uh, and that's why we need to unify. You know, because uh, if they they're, if they continue to brand us as illegal, as immigrant, as Latino, Hispanic, Mestizo, Chicano, Mexican American, Mexican, Bolivian, Canadian, and on and on, we 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 will not overcome those obstacles to unify as our racial roots, Native American of, from America and nowhere else. You know, so thank you all, thank you all for having us. And yes, uh, let's have a quicker gestation gestation period for the, part three. <laughs> Thank you all so much. Thank you, Tlaxaltiani. Thank you, Dr. Samaripa and all the readers. Please uh, visit our website, uh, browncontinent.com, our blog. There's a lot of articles there on identity. Thank you, Kiawi, for your palabra, for sharing your wisdom, and, um, and Dr. Samaripa as well. Um, if you, do you want to close, uh, Manuel? Um, th uh, yeah, thank you for that. Uh, Thank you uh, to uh, Kiawi for spending your time here with us again, uh, hermano. Um, just always love to hear our, our dialogues together and everything that you bring with your, your wisdom and your experience um, and, and hopefully letting more and more people know about Brown, Co Brown Continent as well and the work that y'all are doing. So crucial to everything we've been talking about. Um, and thank you Tlasotiani for, for moderating and for putting this together um, and, and bringing this and pushing this forward, this discussion. And, uh, you know, so I just want to give my gratitude to everybody that, that showed up. Um, and if you have anything else you'd like to add, again, you can, you can find us uh, here on Facebook or Instagram and, or, or just email us or go to our website, rasapsychology.org. Um, and uh, I just, you know, I don't really have anything to say, but I just want to give gratitude. I think one of the things that we're trying to do, I think all of us is push boundaries. And so I think sometimes people are like, you know, like, what, what does psychology have to do with this? Well, you know, mainstream psychology doesn't have anything to do with this. But if we think about it in the way that we're thinking about it, uh, you know, how we see ourselves, you know, some people call that psychology, you know, some people call it philosophy, some people call it just living, but how we see ourselves has everything to do with this. And so that's part of the work that we're trying to do um, in, in the work that we're doing is um, um, trying to recenter this work in ways that really matter, that are important to our community. So um, I think I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you all. Okay, so in added um, gratitude from all seven directions, from all of our hearts, from the energies of the sacred land where each of us is, um, uh, we hope that we had this conversation in a good way and that we continue to have these conversations and move forward together in a good way. 
So thank you, Tlasakamati, to all of you. Moment down.